Welcome to Plenary Session 5 and to Day 2 of ASFA 2013 National Conference and Expo. My name is Anne Ward. I'm Chairman of Qantas Superannuation and of Colonial First State Investments and I'm your Session Facilitator for this important plenary this morning. Now yesterday we all learnt together about the changing environment and the societal, economic, political and business challenges that we all face. And I was uh, particularly taken with Geoffrey Robertson's concept of the moral megatrends that are also shaping our world. Now at this session we're going to prepare for the new horizon by exploring the different investment landscape. And we're going to hear some new thinking and new ideas about how we might need to structure our investments in the future. Our format is that there'll be a presentation and we'll then be joined on stage uh, for questions and answers with two uh, additional panellists. Uh, our two panellists this morning are Robert Harrison, President and Chief Executive Officer for North America of FFTW, and Ella Brown, Head of Fundamental Equities for AMP Capital. And Robert and Ella will join me on stage after the presentation. Now I'd like to introduce our leading presenter to kick off the session this morning with a high-level view of the investment landscape. He's an investment expert with over 28 years' experience in finance in Asia, European and US markets. And some delegates in the audience might know him as the author of the investment newsletter, Things That Make You Go Hmm. So from Singapore, please welcome to the stage, Grant Williams. Thanks very much, Anne. Uh, let's just make sure this thing's working. Here we go. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks uh, for giving up this beautiful Perth morning to come and listen to me speak. You may regret that, I think, by the end of it. You're going to probably wish you'd stayed in bed, I'm afraid. But the good folks at ASFA uh, foolishly told me to pull no punches. Uh, so with the caveat firmly in place, they told me to do this. Off we go. As I said, they did tell me to do this, so I apologise for the faint of heart amongst you. Now, the theme for uh, this year's conference is not over the rainbow, but rather beyond the horizon. And a wise man once said that in order to try and understand what is beyond the horizon, it makes sense to understand what lays behind us. Uh, in order to try and peer into the future, we're going to take a look at what lays in the rearview mirror behind us and see how we came to be where we are today. Now, any presentation that begins with poor, sweet Dorothy being turned into a wizened old hag can probably only get better, you would think. But I think that's probably going to be the high point for some people here. There's a fly around me now. Look at this. Um, <laughs> among my briefing notes for the conference was a phrase which resonated strongly with me. And that was this one. Think different, I was told. Now, as soon as I read those two words, my mind immediately turned to a series of ads that ran in the 1990s for a small upstart computer company called Apple. The ads featured visionaries who changed the world through the actions they took in the normal course of their lives. Whether it's boxing, music, filmmaking, or even sticking your hand up a frog, these pioneers change the lives of millions. By thinking differently, Steve Jobs and his colleagues somehow managed to briefly uh, generate the biggest company the world had ever seen, and at the same time maintain this image of being a plucky, cool underdog. It was sheer brilliance. Today's financial world is driven by a different group of geniuses. This fly's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> Central bankers. And the current crop has been forced to think differently to any who've held the office before. And the creativity of their thinking has ramifications for every single person sitting in this room today. Those Apple ads of the late 1990s could have been written for today's central bankers, the crazy ones. Like Apple's target demographic, Draghi, Kuroda, Carney, Bernanke, and the rest of the gang aren't fond of rules, and they too have no respect for the status quo. They're quoted, disagreed with, glorified by politicians, vilified by many market professionals, and I hold my hand up to being one of those. Uh, but more than anything else, what they cannot be is ignored, because they've changed everything. 
and I'm afraid in ways that could ultimately end in disaster. Uh, so, after an extraordinary period of coordinated loose monetary policy in all the world's uh, major economies, we are now near the popping point of the third great bubble of the last 15 years, and each one of them has been bigger than the last. The tech bubble was kick-started by a short period of low rates that uh, Alan Greenspan instituted after the long-term capital management collapse, uh, all in the name of saving the system, of course. Uh, next up, the maestro blew uh, an historic housing bubble in the United States by holding rates far too low for far too long between 2002 and 2004 to try and avert a recession. And the bursting of that particular bubble, as we all know only too well, uh, led to the unprecedented central bank action and the unfathomable market conditions that we face today. And it's caused an epic bubble in government debt that when it inevitably bursts, is gonna cause problems of a magnitude far greater than those we saw in 2008. Now, of course, we are about to enter the Janet Yellen era. And poor Janet is gonna to have to try and find an even bigger bubble than government debt uh, to blow um, if she's not going to be the one at the helm when this thing goes down. I have my doubts personally that she's going to be able to find one, but that's to be determined in a future date. But will the knock-on effects of central bank actions, are they working? And most importantly, how does it affect the way in which we in this room have to invest for the next few years? In an attempt to explain what QE does uh, to a group of wealthy Americans about a year ago, I put this slide together to explain to them why they suddenly didn't feel wealthy anymore. Uh, and it worked beautifully. It also happens to explain the purpose of, without any shadow of a doubt, the biggest factor anyone trying to invest their capital has to deal with over the last se several years and probably the next couple, and that's quantitative easing. Now, QE has been lauded as the savior of the world, but now, like Frankenstein's monster, it's taken on a life of its own. And as we've seen in recent months, as talk of the taper has wobbled markets everywhere, the, uh, the geniuses who gave this thing life just don't have the guts to kill it. That's a huge problem which, like the monster, is only going to get bigger and more dangerous. Make no mistake, when you look beyond the horizon, quantitative easing is and will continue to be the single biggest influence on every investment decision you're going to be making, possibly for the next several years. But it didn't used to be this way. The vast majority of us in this auditorium today have spent our careers in a world of traditional risk and asset allocation models, when alpha could be generated by smart managers and traditional methods of both overall allocation and bottom-up asset allocation uh, learned over hundreds of years of economic history could be relied upon to generate performance within defined and wholly acceptable risk parameters. It was a very safe environment, give or take a few hiccups along the way. And the asset allocation industry, at least the traditional part of it represented here today, likes safe. It likes predictable because those are the sorts of steady, consistent returns that allow pension funds planning for the long term to compound and match their liabilities to their funding. Lovely. What we've witnessed for the last 30 years, as you can see here, is essentially a one-way bull market in equities, corporate bonds, government bonds, not to mention both real estate and commodities. Sure, there have been hiccups along the way, 1987, 99, and of course 2008 being the obvious ones. But essentially, particularly in the safer confines of bond markets, where the shakeouts have been fewer and far less dramatic, as you can see here, a buy and hold strategy has worked remarkably well, as long as your time horizon was long enough. Now, however, we've reached the point where the bills have come due for those last blissful 30 years. And in a desperate attempt to avoid paying them and taking the consequential pain inherent in doing so, we're seeing the flip side of that, of that confiscation of interest income we saw a couple of slides ago, as investors are forced into darker corners of the investment world in order to replace that which they've been relieved of by those kindly central bankers. And that's led to some obvious mispricing of certain assets. And we're not talking about esoteric assets here, we're talking about bonds and we're talking about equities. We've already seen the steady progression of bond and equity prices from bottom left to top right over the last 30 years. But if we take a closer look at where we currently stand, we'll see some other interesting things. And we'll begin with government bond yields. And this jumbled mess shows the yields on UK, Japanese, German, Canadian, French, and good old Aussie 10-year sovereigns. German bond yields, all-time lows. Aussies, all-time lows. UK gilts, as near as damn it, same thing. Folks, this is what a bubble looks like, period. <laughs> 
How bad is the bubble in the government bond market? Well, this chart shows that our friends in the United States of America, with their $17 trillion deficit and their completely dysfunctional government, hasn't been more creditworthy at any point in the last 223 years. France, soon to be the new, new crisis in Europe, and just last week downgraded by S&P, has never been able to borrow money more cheaply than they can now in 400 years of recorded history. And good old Great Britain, whilst not quite at the same extremes, is still looking at rates below which it hasn't often been able to raise money in several centuries. And then there's Japan. Currently, the Japanese government has a debt to GDP ratio of 240% and public debts of one quadrillion yen. Now, quadrillion is kind of a weird number. Uh, how much is it? Well, if you wanted to count to a quadrillion, it would take you 31,709,792 years. That's a lot of money to owe someone. Now, Kuroda-san, the newly installed Bank of Japan governor, has recently made investors a few promises, which is very nice of him. He promised to double the monetary base in 14 months, which is an extraordinary thing to do. He promised he would create 2% inflation, and he promised, and I quote, to make JGBs as unattractive as possible. The result? Well, JGB investors initially seemed to get the joke, and rates started to rise very quickly. In fact, they doubled inside a month. But with debt servicing costs of $257 billion, that's a 14% year-on-year increase, in, uh, the, the Bank of Japan quickly realized that actually they couldn't afford for rates to go higher. <laughs> so they stepped into the market to push those rates back down again. And they're now buying up to 80% of their own issuance. So I ask you, at these prices, do these bonds, supposedly the safest on the face of the, of the planet, look like they would represent only 10% of the risk in a traditional 60-40 portfolio? I don't think so either. So it must be time to rotate out of those bonds uh, into equities. Great, except everywhere we look, equities are at nosebleed levels. The S&P just made another all-time high. Over in Europe, Germany's DAX, same story, another all-time high for the DAX. So how about emerging markets? Perhaps we can find somewhere in Asia where we can rotate to find some value. Here's the Indian Sensex Index, all-time high. Even South Africa, Johannesburg, that market too is making new high after new high. And yet, all this is occurring against the backdrop of global growth that's essentially at the lowest levels uh, seen in the last two decades outside of the two major global recessions we've seen. This is despite trillions of dollars of freshly printed money applied in the name of creating growth. Everywhere you look, equities are at levels that would ordinarily scream to portfolio managers to take some money off the table and retreat into the safety of you know what. Interestingly enough, there's one major market that is flashing red, and that's China, supposedly the engine of growth for the world. That market is still 65% off its highs that it reached in 2008. Now, if you think that doesn't mean anything, I think you're wrong. We don't know what it means yet, but it's flashing a red light, and we'll find out at some point in the future what it does mean. In the meantime, though, we need to get back to the horizon we're trying to see beyond here today. And at this point in the proceedings, it's time to take a look a little closer to home uh, and examine the predicament facing none other than the boy from the Shire himself, Glenn Stevens. Because in Stevens' predicament, lessons are lessons for ordinary investors about the unintended consequences forced upon us because of policy decisions. Now, as far as predicaments goes, New York detective John McLean is in a class apart. McLean is a tough cop who continually seems, through no fault of his own, I hasten to add, to get himself into a series of nasty situations that seem impossible to get out of without the need for a massive cleanup. Here in Australia, one of the world's best central bankers, <laughs> sorry, Glenn, uh, one, of, one of the world's best central bankers is now finding himself backed into a corner from which it's hard to see a way out without some serious damage being caused. Now, over the past several years, Stevens has remained admirably independent, and he's stuck to a policy that harkened back to the days pre-2008 when central bankers had something that used to be called credibility. However, Stevens now finds himself trapped in a Nakatomi Plaza economy where danger awaits him at every turn. And that begins with the strength of the Australian dollar. This chart shows the spread of the RBA cash target over the US Fed funds rate. And as you can see, Stevens had no qualms about allowing it to rise into the teeth of 2009 and beyond, just as the world's other major central banks were slashing their rates very quickly to zero. He did that because it felt right for Australia. Over the past two years, Stevens has changed his course dramatically, dropping the RBA cash target to a historic low of 2.5%. Uh, 
But a look at the differential between Aussie and US rates shows that from a historical perspective, Stevens is still presiding over a currency that's far more attractive than many of his peers. This had a predictable effect on the Australian dollar, as you all know, uh, of course, which strengthened to all-time highs. The trouble came, belatedly, when Stevens found himself needing to reverse this cycle uh, and lower rates to weaken the currency again. By the time he started trying to play catch-up, as you can see here, the Aussie, which had then, uh, up until that point, as you can see from the two charts, responded beautifully to RBA policy, uh, refused to play ball. Stevens had essentially lost control of his own currency, and that was largely due to the actions of some of his less disciplined peers in faraway lands, EPKA Aussie dollar. But it wasn't just interest rate differentials causing the unwanted strength in the Aussie. Australia's case of Dutch disease, the hollowing out of the manufacturing sector through the strong currency that comes with the booming natural resources sector, is hardly the first of its kind, as these other examples demonstrate, but it's certainly just about the most severe on record, certainly in modern times. As large swathes of Australia have been dug up and stuck on boats bound for China over the past 15 years, the Aussie dollar has strengthened relentlessly to the point, amazingly enough, where Sydney and Melbourne now sit comfortably in the top four on the, econ uh, on the economists' uh, most expensive places to live in the world, uh, behind Tokyo and Osaka, and ahead of places like Geneva, Singapore and London. The strength of the resource sector and the wealth it's attracted to this sunburned country has given Stevens a major headache. We've seen how the relative strength in the Aussie dollar has forced Stevens into cutting rates. But the flow of money into the country as a result of that resources boom has had a stunning effect on house prices, which are in a bubble, making that which burst in the United States in 2008 seem like not very much at all. Rates, you would think, from this have to go up. But of course, if Stevens raises rates to choke off a housing bubble, that's not going to play well with Australia's rapidly rising unemployment rate. So that would suggest that he needs to put rates down. Then, of course, there's the always present inflation pressure. Now, this one could go either way at this point. Uh, it really doesn't help him in any way, shape, or form. Can he cut rates again? Well, he certainly has the room to against his peers, but that would just stoke inflation and add fire to the fu uh, fuel to the fire already burning in the Australian housing market. So what can he do? Well, he can do what the other central bankers who are stuck uh, or trying to save some of their ammunition do. He can try and jawbone the markets in the direction he wants them to go. At a recent investment conference, Stevens made this, uh, some extraordinary statements which have a very clear intent. There's no way a central banker uses the term materially lower uh, uh, without it being very, very intentional, I can assure you. Uh, funnily enough, it worked. Amazingly, people still listen to the central bankers. The Aussie, from the moment he spoke, started to fall. But elsewhere in Stephen's speech were what card players refer to as tells. This sentence, meant as an assertion of future action by the Fed, when I looked at it, it seemed to me to be missing something. Surely the taper will come. Surely. Here's hoping. But the biggest giveaway as to Stephen's desperate situation was this line. As he implored the other central bankers to begin the long journey home from Crazy Town, he seemed to be sending a subliminal message, which if we rearrange the letters, actually comes through loud and clear. Stevens is in a bind. The problem is it's not necessarily of his own making, but it's a situation that he, like us as investors, are forced to deal with by other people's actions. And that means adjusting his own policy in response to the actions of desperate men like Draghi, Bernanke, and Kuroda and the gang. But such adjustments can be very hard to come to terms with, and nowhere is that better illustrated than here in the pension fund industry. The world that quantitative easing and central bank intervention has created is fraught for investors, all investors. Well, what does it mean for those of us trying to figure out what's beyond the horizon? Well, in a word, decisions. Tough ones. Many pension funds refuse to stray from their projected returns, many of which are in the region of 8% uh, per annum, despite uh, the fact that recent history suggests that going forward, this could be a deeply flawed strategy. Thankfully, there is a disclaimer for that, though. But so far, as the QE experiment continues, returns have been OK but for all the wrong reasons, as the capital returns in bond portfolios have masked the coming yield destruction. This has led to many uh, pension funds refusing to lower their target returns to more realistic levels because that would obviously require some rather uncomfortable conversations about funding levels. Now, to illustrate this, I'm going to turn to CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System, and take a look at a move that they made back in 2012. At the risk of preaching to the choir, uh, CalPERS is the largest pension fund in the United States and the fifth largest in the world with 233 billion in assets under management as of July 2012. 
It was also underfunded by somewhere between 25% and 40%, depending on the measure used. Traditionally, as many people in this room will know, being funded to 80% is the minimum assumed to be safe. In Calpa's case, this white disc in the center of the blue disc, uh, the blue disc representing their fund's liabilities, shows the level of their funding. Now, on March the 12th, 2012, CalPERS lowered their expected annual return from 7.75% to 7.5%, and this was despite their own actuary recommending they, uh, they lower it to 7.25%. Why did they do that? Well, the catalyst was the announcement that their returns for fiscal year 2012 were 1%, a performance which put them uh, below 99% of the major US pension funds. Now, granted, the fund had averaged 8.8% returns over the previous 20 years, but as somebody once said, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Sadly, the magic of compounding works for evil as well as good, and it doesn't take long periods of underperformance for a fund that relies on this magic to fall woefully behind. If we are to enter a decade or more of significantly lower and possibly even negative returns at, at, at certain points, as I suspect, the gaps in funding for many funds will be gargantuan. Oh, incidentally, uh, those assumptions were based on CalPERS being funded 100%. But I don't mean to pick on CalPERS. This is a far more endemic problem. In 2010, according to NASRA, a public fund survey in the United States shows return projections amongst the US state retirement plans. 8% return projections were very much in vogue, as you can see here. Three years later, things have changed a little, including the way they actually uh, split up the brackets. But 8% is still the favorite number by far. But despite lofty projections, and for the most part, highly friendly markets, as we've seen, funding levels have fallen by 25% in the last decade or so, a trend which, let's face it, with interest rates stuck where they are for the foreseeable future, is only going to continue, I'm afraid. This is another problem waiting to manifest itself when reality can no longer be ignored. But what is the reality? Well, the reality of the situation we're facing right now is somewhat confronting, to say the least. And it's all thanks to the distortions that massive central bank intervention has created through the manipulation of supposedly free markets, all with the best possible intentions, of course. Now, I'm sure that Benny and the inkjets would, when looking at definition two there, choose the word shrewd over the word devious. But as we've seen from the way they've actually confiscated income from the most prudent investors and tried to coerce them into the uh, inflation at risk asset prices, there's far more deviousness at play here than shrewdness. It helps, of course, to have a complicit audience. But what does that mean for the future? Well, let's go back to the beginning of this little journey along the yellow brick road and those traditional allocation models and see how they stack up in the current environment. You remember this, I'm sure. Well, if these are the lines along which you're investing, then you're confronting a very interesting paradigm. Let's break it down. Your biggest allocation, well, as we've seen, there are historical highs. And this is purely because of government intervention. Despite the perilous state of the world as a whole, and particularly the finances of the, uh, of the issuing authorities themselves. But never mind, that's a problem for another day. What about equities? Well, they too, unfortunately, are manipulated. This, th these are all-time highs purely because of the promise of an ocean of freshly printed money coming into markets each and every month that's going to be looking for a home. And while we're at it, we may as well throw in commodities. Why not? These are the final refuge for fiat currency when paper gains are exhausted, and the zero cost of money ensures that commodity prices will remain artificially high. And all this brings me to the question that I'm sure is on everybody in the room's lips right now. Oh, hang on. There, that's better. <laughs> Let's take a look at a few hard truths and try and figure out what might happen from here. Now, the first thing you need to understand, uh, I think is very important, is this. The taper, it's not going to happen. Not in any meaningful way, anyway. The Fed is completely trapped. Don't get me wrong, the Yellen Fed may, and I stress the word may, make the mistake of attempting a mild reduction in the level of stimulus from 85 billion to 65 billion, as Bernanke threatened to do in May. But if they do, they're going to be forced into backtracking very quickly, and what's left of their credibility will be gone. The US economy is simply not strong enough to survive without massive stimulus. And besides, the taper actually isn't as big a deal as you might expect from all the fuss it caused. This is the Fed's balance sheet uh, projected out to 2015, assuming they continue buying their $85 billion a month in treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And this is what it would look like, assuming they tapered $20 billion a month. Hard to see what all the fuss is about, huh? Here's something else I know. 
If the Fed continues to try and force real interest rates into negative territory, the $2.3 trillion currently sitting on the Fed's balance sheet as excess reserves, that's 50% increase in a single year, that will pour into risk assets seeking positive returns and that will spark hideous inflation. What else? Well, government bonds we've seen. They're in a bubble, period. Equity prices are now completely detached from fundamental valuations in many cases. Market breadth in the US, well, that's almost non-existent once you strip out computerized trading, which is now 70% of the volume on the New York Stock Exchange. Our friends at the central banks, well, they're pretty much out of bullets, I'm afraid. And just about every government in the Western world is essentially bankrupt. And finally, we're in this competitive race to debase all the fiat currencies. There can be no winners if you're all trying to have the cheapest currency in the world. It just doesn't work, I'm afraid. But all this begs the next big question that I'm sure you're now all thinking. And that question is, of course, oh, damn it, hold on. There, that's better. What do we do now? Well, first of all, don't listen to me. There are far smarter guys than me who are screaming, screaming similar sentiments to those that I've laid out here for you today. So let's hear from a few of them before I wrap things up. Beginning with Elliot's Paul Singer, who had this to say in a recent letter to investors. Now Singer's concerns, as always, are well-voiced and accurate. This guy's made a lot of money in these markets. People need to listen to him. But it's not only money managers who see these disconnects. Two CEOs of two of the most darling stocks in the United States at the moment recently scratched their heads in wonder at their own stock valuation. Tesla's Elon Musk and Netflix's Reed Hastings, neither of whom understand their own stock prices. Now you would think if anyone, those two would have a better idea of what constituted fair value. Want the view of one of the savviest real estate investors in the world? Well, look no further than Starwood Capital's Barry Sternlicht, who pulled no punches in a recent interview. I think he's right, and I think arguably he doesn't even come close. Jim Rogers, uh, famous for wearing a bow tie these days, uh, can always be relied upon to be fairly forthright, and again, he lived up to his reputation in a recent interview. And these words are important, and we'll come back to them in a moment. Now, the Kyle Sandilands Award for Plain Speaking definitely goes to Sock Gen's Albert Edwards, who called it exactly as he sees it, uh, and didn't mince his words. And he finished this diatribe with 13 very important words. The final word, however, goes to Universal Investment CIO Mark Spitznagel, who in a recent interview told Maria Bartiromo that he felt the US equity market was set up for a 40% correction. Spitznagel's advice is telling. Step aside. Step aside. Family offices have a huge advantage over traditional investment managers as they first and foremost try to protect their wealth. They're capable of taking a long-term view that might seem dangerous to some, but their primary concerns are not outflows of capital. This recent city report, uh, of course, completely misses the point in that first paragraph because the reason these investors are going to cash is because they expect poor returns. But the beginning of paragraph two is crucial. Family offices are moving their own investments to cash and saving up their ammunition, and they're doing it fast. And for good reason, the risks of being fully invested are just not commensurate with the potential rewards at these levels. So here's the thing. I began by talking about the need to think different. And never has that been a greater, a greater need when allocating capital than now. But because of the massive manipulation of markets and the corruption of such basic pricing inputs as the risk-free rate, not thinking differently has thus far worked. But it's not because it's prudent. Investors need to not only think differently, but think radically differently. In a QE-shaped world like we're in, traditional investing methods no longer work. What does radically different mean? Well, as one example, traditional allocation models, certainly for the next couple of years, you can pretty much tear those up. A portfolio that has 30% in synthesized bonds, and by that I mean assets that synthesize a cash flow, uh, but aren't yet anyway in the crosshairs of government QE programs, will likely outperform bonds at these lofty prices. Things like real estate, assuming you can find it at a fair value. Something which is becoming harder as uh, smart investors look for ways to replace the cash flows from their bond portfolios. Or productive farmland, which is a big thing here in Australia, which provides in, uh, uh, exposure to income streams from the one commodity that mankind is always going to consume, and that's food and cash, plenty of cash. You have to be brave. You have to take your money out of markets now and go to cash. Be in a position to take advantage when this thing falls down because it's gonna fall down. 
Go to the maximum levels of cash you have, and once you're there, lobby to have that level raised. There will be time for you to invest in a world that makes a lot more sense to us. What we face is this, a horizon that's both impossible to see beyond with any certainty and a world where decisions about capital allocation can mean opting to potentially miss out on continuing returns because they're powered not by fundamentals but rather by a pure force of central bank intervention uh, and everything from the true cost of capital to bond and equity markets themselves or simply holding your nose and investing on that basis even though it may run counter to everything we've learned in our careers just because you don't want to miss out. Personally, I don't like to play in games that are rigged, so I choose to sit out the next phase of this great experiment in search of an entry point that offers true long-term value. Because you make your money when you buy things, not when you sell them. If you buy something at the right price, you will make, we will make money out of it. If you buy it at the wrong price, you'd make it very, very hard for yourselves. The good news is, once we get beyond the shakeout that I fear lies just at the horizon, the landscape won't be so radically different to that which we've become familiar over the years. Once the impurities of quantitative easing are flushed from the system, we can go back to investing in a world that we all understand. Right now is the time when the landscape is different, and it's right now when we have to think differently. Luckily, all the clues we need are, be, are to be found looking backwards rather than forwards. Eventually, a more familiar landscape to all of us will reassert itself. It always has and it always will. History proves that beyond any doubt. History also proves that though things seem different today, we really have been here before. In fact, we were here, almost exactly here, in the late 1920s. Now, what happened next is only too familiar to students of market history. We had a 48% correction. And if you look at the steepness of that slope, you'll see it was a quick thing. Now, after her adventures in the fantastic land of Oz, all Dorothy had to do to return to the world which, with, with which she was so familiar was to click her heels together three times and say there's no place like home. Returning to a world with which we are familiar is going to require either some real magic on the parts of Draghi, Kuroda, Carney, and soon-to-be Miss Yellen, or some kind of tornado that sweeps away everything in its path and allows the world to build again from more solid foundations. So, more central bank conjuring tricks or the forces of nature? Place your bets. Thank you very much for listening.